Hi, and welcome everyone to the Creative Cast. My name is Lucas Homan, and today on the show we have Christina Fazekas. I'm very excited to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Um, so, as far as I know, you're an artist divided into different genres like photography, journalism. And I would love to start with you presenting yourself so the audience get to know you a little bit better. So I was born in Budapest in Hungary uh, and um, I studied media and journalism in Budapest. And then I was around 27, yeah, 27 years old and I moved to New York. Mm -hmm. And I moved to New York because of photography. So... Um, Besides journalism, photography was my passion. And I started to take photos actually when I was 14, but only in my head. So I was like walking around in the city and I just heard this click, click. That's a good photo. That's a good photo. And then uh, I was 17 years old when I asked my father and he gave me a camera. He was also passionate about um, photography. And also about video eight. Uh, so he was doing video eight movies mm -hmm. on film. You know, this is like, is anyone knows still <laughs> what is video what is eight? Film? What is video <laughs> eight? So, and so it was sort of like a little bit of a heritage from mm -hmm. him. And he uh, gave me then um, as a present a camera and, and I uh, took a little workshop and then I started to take photos as mm -hmm. passion. And I was already at the university when I went to um, an artist residency in Hungary. And that was quite amazing. I was doing their films and I was the, uh, doing their, uh, some photography works mm -hmm. as well. And uh, the leader of the residency really loved my photography and he offered me an exhibition. Mm -hmm. So I was 21 when I had my first exhibition in Dior. Wow. Yeah, it was very nice. So, and I was like uh, doing a lot of journalism, also like uh, photographing and writing for music magazines. And some, somehow always like photography and journalism was, was like running parallel. So for, mm -hmm. for some magazines, I was doing only photography. For some magazines, I was doing only photography. And then for some, I was doing both. <laughs> and I also was working for radios or television. And then um, in, in 2004, I moved to New York because suddenly all the jobs were gone for freelancers. Oh. Uh, and, uh, and I thought like, you know, but, uh, to hunger, I can anywhere. So why not mm -hmm. then hunger in New York? So I just sold my car. I bought a, a plane ticket and I simply flew, knock, uh, flew to, to, flew to, to New York. Mm -hmm. So to start there, I wanted to stay like half a year and I stayed like four years. And nice. so what time are we talking about here? It is between 2004, January, 2007, hmm. June, July. Okay. Uh, yeah, approximately. And um, I was lucky because I uh, was, um, I was able to get a media visa yeah. and I was working as a freelancer, as a New York correspondent mm -hmm. to uh, televisions and radios in Hungary. And, um, also I met, um, um, it's an owner. He was actually the owner and, and, uh, he actually established, uh, established a newspaper for Hungarian, for the Hungarian community in, in the United States. And at first he asked me to work for him as, um, editor and then as an editor, um, editor in chief at the end. And it was very nice. It was a beautiful period. You know, it was a lot of fun in New York and it was like a small team, but a very good team. You know, most of the people were from the uni or just out of the uni mm -hmm. or, you know, and, uh, no, yeah, I was already finished. <laughs> <at the uni. laughs> um, yeah. 
And there I was also doing a lot of photography and I took uh, really great photography courses at the School of Visual Arts and International mm -hmm. Center of Photography. And I was freelancing and doing every job which was coming to me in New York. Mm -hmm. And somehow there I was like really establishing a very nice life in New York okay. with a lot of photography and with journalism. Yeah. May I ask uh, what your photography was based on? Like, was it mainly portraits or just street? That was mainly, nee, that was mainly portraits. It was a lot of portraits. I was doing a lot of fashion. Mm -hmm. I was uh, working for a New York Cool magazine, which was an online magazine. And I was there in every fashion week in New York uh, because I was taking runway photos for the magazine. And then once mm -hmm. we even went to Miami and we do, were doing the Miami uh, Fashion Week Ooh, la, la. Okay. Uh, for, for, uh, for the magazine. So it was like really great. So from Hungary, from music photography and going from festivals to festivals in New York, going from fashion shows to fashion shows, actually. Sounds like a dream. Yeah, it was really nice. I mean, but you know, it, uh, this is a funny thing because uh, also in Hungary, yeah. the music ma magazine itself was not paying. You mm -hmm. know, that was like a, a startup uh, yeah. magazine for um, someone, a young person who is still today one of my best friends. So mm -hmm. this friendship is like now more than 20 years. Ne? Huh. And we are in, in, we are very close friendships. So it was really like a, a, a group of friends were doing this, or we became friends to do mm. this magazine at that time. And New York Cool was something very similar. You know, there okay. was a, uh, so, uh, a woman, Wendy, uh, from Texas, mm -hmm. you know, and she was a little bit older woman, but she was like super cool. <laughs> she was living in New York and, uh, And then she had this idea to do this New York cool. It was fashion and lifestyle. And uh, ev everyone was working there actually to be able to get into these events, you know. And some of them like uh, Evan, Evan became like a big ass food photographer for the New York Times food magazine. Ooh. And, you know, and and Kat, Catherine, she's uh, from Barcelona, Uh, she really became like a really, really great photographer running her own business in mm. Barcelona, you know? So it's like, uh, I see the people and I see the career of the people, mm. how they like, uh, became like really, really good in that, what they were doing. And they yeah. really started from, from these nests. Okay. It was like a jump board. Yeah, and exactly. Then, uh, somehow, uh, somehow, exactly. No. Uh, sorry, what was the name of this Hungarian newspaper? The Hungarian newspaper where I was working, that was uh, uh, Ohid, that's the bridge, but uh, uh, yeah, the, the bridge. The bridge. Yeah, okay. Ohid, that's how it started. Mm. Uh, uh, that was that was really printed, mm -hmm. so it was really, really nice. It was like really printed, It's it doesn't exist anymore, oh, so it's okay. gone. <laughs> so, really, it's, it's gone, uh, so it's interesting. Uh, But it was a very, very nice period. And then um, then in New York, I met someone. In New York also, I was very much focusing on, at the beginning, focusing on commercial photography. So all the courses, what I took was uh, fashion photography or advertisements for uh, photography. The only one was at the International Center of Photography, the developing an image from an idea that was more going into the... Um, artsy direction mm -hmm. and uh, there I was also more working on on really art projects so that's that's uh, it was very interesting I met someone oh I I and I also got to know the New York Jewish theater mm -hmm. and I was working for them oh. they are also like the Tuvia Tenenbaum is like a big ass uh, author actually and um He just published in the last years, like a series of books and they like really get very, very good feedback or from Spiegel. He's also a journalist for Spiegel. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and then through them, I got to know uh, someone who gave me a book, 
uh, and this is was a book about <clears throat> contemporary photography, mm. really in New York. So it was like sort of uh, the th thematic of the book was very interesting, but they were really artists who were at that moment in New York exhibited in galleries. Yeah. And I took a look to this book and before all my photography was, my art, art photography was like black and white and very traditional yeah, sort of. Old school. Really old school, you know, <laughs> like really, really old school. And I took a look at this book and I said like, wow, Okay, <laughs> so that, that's photography today. <laughs> <laughs> that exists, okay. Nice. Okay, so this is art photography today. You know, like I was still living in this Andre Kertes, mm. Robert Kappa sort of world, mm. which is like both is great Hungarian yeah. photographers went to other countries and became mm. famous somewhere else as Hungary. True. Andre Kertes, very famous no? photographer. Yeah, and... Uh, and uh, and then I've seen this contemporary photography, Gregory Crudzon with the stage mm -hmm. photography, what I really loved, you know, and then I started to go to try that out. And uh, in the last year in New York, I was really, really experimenting into the staged photography, color, mm -hmm. uh, but also with different cameras. So then I also like, I bought a digital camera, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, also because of the jobs, but I bought a digital camera and then, uh, and then I had a pinhole camera. Oh, yes. And you used it? And I used it Ooh. and it was like, it was on a, um, on a big format photography. So it was sheet films mm -hmm. and I was, I was photo, I'm still photographing with this camera on sheet films. Yes. So okay. I'm still, I have all, all my cameras, what I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Good for you. Uh, you didn't have to sell them. <laughs> no, one was stolen. Oh, one was well, okay. one was stolen, but uh, no. I mean, they also like uh, the 20D. I used forever, mm -hmm. so I used the 20D like more than ten years oh. or so. You know. Yeah. Uh, and all the others are film cameras, yeah. so this is like they all stayed with me. Yeah. But you use mainly like 35 millimeter uh, on film or? No, no, actually, no. Uh, what happened is then, then um, after, at that time, uh, I had a 35 millimeter Canon, mm -hmm. actually. And then uh, I had this 20D uh, Canon camera, a digital. And then when I moved to London uh, after New York, then I bought a Mamiya, mm. a Mamiya nice. RZ RZ um, um, six seven. Okay, you know it's. I don't know that one. <laughs> it's, a okay. medium, it's a medium format. Yes. It's like it's really was created well, you look for. Down. Yeah, exactly. Okay, you nice. look down. So there you have the two, the Hasselblad, mm. what everyone knows. Sure. On and um, the Mamiya mm. and the Hasselblad is uh, uh, smaller, makes totally square photos. Yeah. And you can run around on the street with it. And mm. the Mamiya, it makes a six by seven. So it's a little bit oh, bigger. Yeah, slightly, slightly off. Okay. A, li a little bit bigger, so it's not square. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was really created for studio photography. Okay. Uh, so you can make amazing portraits with it. Yeah. And uh, when I went to London to study yeah. photography, because in, in New York, when I've seen this, I, at one point I realized that that I never had an academic um, education about mm. photography. Mm. It's blocking me in my art. You felt that? I felt that. Mm. And I really felt that I need more knowledge, you know. So, so I wanted to go back to university. I had already a master in media and communication. And I said, okay, then I, I want to have a, a degree in okay. photography as well. That sounds amazing. I mean, doesn't that is that's often a question that young people ask themselves nowadays for young photographers. Like, do I really need a degree to perform this this art as as a job? And mo like nowadays, most people see that they don't need it. But it's so refreshing to hear someone say, "Oh, back in the days, like I worked in it, and then at some point." I felt like that without it, I would have a disadvantage. 
Yes, especially because I have to tell you, when you are in the art world, you have to be able to talk about art in a in an um, appropriate and and academic way. Yeah. Otherwise, they are not taking you seriously. Mm. So you have to explain your your work and and where your work is in in this in this art historical flow. Yeah. You know where it's your art is connected in. Although as an artist, you're not working like that. You're working from the guts. I'm sure. also working from the guts. You know, but it, it, but at that point, I really felt that it's missing me to be really able to to jump in my art to the next level because mm. all the photographers, what I knew yeah. and where I'm coming, you know, it is was this very traditional photography. And then I read this book and I've seen like, okay, there is a new world out there in art photography and uh, and uh, you would just have to get no more about it what sort of uh, different yeah, thematic exists exist there you yes. know and i really felt that and it was really really good that i made this master in london mm -hmm. you know this was really not just because of the academic knowledge but to really we were learning a lot about freud you know, yes, it's really? like psychology, the psychology of the photographer, the psychology of the audience, that mm -hmm. you understand what you are doing. Because even nowadays, when I'm creating an artwork, I'm doing it from sort of like, it's it just like, it's from the guts, you know, it's, it's just these images are popping in my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I need really time sometimes to understand what I'm really doing, you yeah. know, because this is just emotions and, and experiences. And, and then suddenly this idea is there, this image is there, what you want to do. And mm. then they ask like, and what's that? What sort of photography you are doing? Uh, and I mean, I'm saying like art and yeah. like, oh, landscapes, you know? So it's like, you, you see these categories, yes. you know, and, and, and. And contemporary art is not fitting into these categories anymore, actually, sure. yeah, you know? Yeah. And, it, and and the education helps you so much finding the right words. Exactly. To really try to, to explain. It. That's why I'm saying no. I'm like, that's why I'm not even saying anymore. I'm That also took me like years to be able to say I'm a photographer or the, because I, because I didn't felt like that I'm, I'm entitled to say that. Yeah. And then it took me even longer to be able to say I'm an artist, <sighs> you know, to, to really say like, I'm an artist. Although I had exhibitions, I had exhibitions in New York. Mm -hmm. And when I was in London, I had a lot of exhibitions. So London was perfect. So anyone who wants to really, I can recommend London for that because mm -hmm. you can just make exhibitions there without endless. So it's endless <laughs> possibilities to make exhibitions. And, um, um, and so it took, it maybe even took till I made my master. So I, mm -hmm. so I made my master in London and then I really felt then I'm now, I can also talk about my art. I know what I'm doing yeah. more or less, you know, <laughs> like minimum <laughs> afterwards, doubt, right? afterwards I can somehow explain, you know, how I got to this point. No. And, um, and then, and then it was interesting when I got to that point when photography was not enough anymore, you know? So at one point I had, I had an art project I, I was working on and photography was not enough anymore. And then video came, oh. you know, to express and, that. Yes, exactly. So the still image was mm -hmm. not be able to really reflect anymore what I wanted to tell. Yeah. And then video came in to my work and somehow it is always in my head. It's always somehow very spatial. So that's why it is sort of like an installational. Yeah. So nothing is just, I never imagined it that it's just hanging on the wall. Mm -hmm. Maybe because also for this project, what I video came in, it was actually commissioned for mm -hmm. Belgium to cook the wheel. It's a, a really amazing um, triennial. So every three years in St. Nicholas, um, the whole city is Coup de Ville. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and I got a house. Uh -oh. So I got a house and I could use this house how I want it. So 
So we were making uh, uh, rooms totally black and dark and other rooms we made white and you could take a look outside. And actually, I think originally it was like somehow downstairs a bar or something. So mm -hmm. there was a space and there was like you're know, walking up on the stairways and there were like sound. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what also came in. So not, oh. not only video, but sound. Yeah. No, so it suddenly became from uh, from photography became like multimedia, yeah. you know, like video and sound. They mm. all like started to work together to create this space for, where you you walked in and then you were in my world. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Coop the Will, I've heard it before. I think is it where this village turns into like an, an exposition? Basically? Yes, it's basically it's something like that. It's not a village. But it's a small town, okay. but it's really a small town. St. Nicholas is a small town. Mm -hmm. And yes, so it's like the whole town, yeah, you know, like it's, it's you can really like, crazy. You, you are, <laughs> it's all uh, public places actually where mm -hmm. the exhibitions are taking place. They have their own um, building, yeah. but there is also in the library or in the park or for example, I got this house nice. and then you are going into this house. Yes. So may I ask, Leila, I would love to talk about specifically about the project you were doing there. Um, what was the message of that? Like, just to understand why you needed that extra video and audio. Okay. So, um, that, um, most of, or most of my work is, are, are very personal. So they are all very personal stories. And this specific story is mother matters. Motto matters. Mother, okay. mother matters. A mother matter. Yeah, I mean, actually, it's mother matters. Okay. Or so that's the origin, mother matters. Mm -hmm. But it's reflecting on the relationship of me and my mother, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's about my childhood. Mm -hmm. And I went back to the house to to where I grew up to make this project. Um, I had a very ambivalent relationship with my mom. Okay. So she was quite abusive mm -hmm. and I had some really, really bad experiences in this house. Okay. And, uh, and I went back to this house sort of to create this project mm -hmm. and also conf confront her with this past. Yeah. And in that uh, year, 2012 was that when I went back, <clears throat> It turned out that uh, uh, she has, uh, she is dement. Mm -hmm. So I, I realized that at that point, so it, we had like, I, uh, we, we came to, to Hungary with my son and we were already in the house for a couple hours and she was not there. And I was like, uh, surprised, you know, yeah. I was living already in Germany. And I was surprised she knew that we are coming, why she's mm -hmm. not there. And then mm -hmm. she came, came home and I said, Hey mom, where were you? You know, we were waiting for you. Why? I was like, yeah, because we arrived. You knew that we are arriving today. From where? I said, like from where? From Germany. Oh. What were you doing in Germany? And I was like, I'm wow. living there. Like what? You are living in Germany for how long now? You know, so she was like, blank blank you know and it's like we had like an hour conversation in this one hour sometimes was 20 years were missing sometimes only two years were missing but it was like sh it was like a shock yeah oh you God. know and it really at one point i couldn't do anything else just taking my my handy yeah i really took phone. my my phone my my uh, cell phone yeah and i started to record it because i said tomorrow when she's okay again she she will not remember mm. and she will say i'm lying yes. so i just started to record uh, i don't know i have like a half an hour recording of our conversation you know so you're going back sort of to face your past to remember and forget and then you recognize then your mother just forgot everything <laughs> you know but you know so this was like it was gone. Mm. I made a project. So the one part of the project was a, um, a part I was like sort of using this um, surrealist method, like thought flow to let everything like and write down everything which comes out. Mm. And I wrote it down. 
what I remember was happening with me in this house. And I put it on the places uh, where they happened. And I photographed these pieces of notes on, on the pillow, on the floor, in the bathroom, everywhere where things happened with mm. me. Uh, and then when I took a look to these photos, when they were developed and I recognized and it's perfect. So I'm using photography, what photography is for to sort of preserve forever, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I censored the text. Mm. I made, made marker, black marker on the, on the prints, you know, I was just censoring them out. So uh, and then, and then I took these little notes and I wanted to burn them and I went to the garden and I wanted to record how I'm burning them. Mm. So that's why, you know, this is what it's working only with video, something to burn, you know, this is a process yeah. you cannot, you can photograph, but it's one photo and there is fire, but that, that these pa pieces of paper yeah. are burning, this has to be a video, you know? Yeah. So I was taking and everything with my cell phone. <laughs> everything with my cell phone so i took my cell phone and uh and uh i tried to burn these papers in the garden in our garden yes. and they would not burn i'm telling you i was just with the matches like hundred times i tried and they would not burn and then i buried them so it was like really like you know you are like you are like this this it's one thing what happens but also what happens mentally so that's when i'm talking about to explain this sort of work then it is actually a process-based work you know it is a process-based work where you at the different stages of the process mm -hmm. happens something and that you can present but the whole artwork is actually way more but you are not able to show it to the people yeah yeah. So, and um, uh, by the way, months later, I digged out these pieces of paper and then the, at the Triennale in Coupe de Ville, the pieces of papers were exhibited ah. with the, the, the dust. dust. And uh, this was already like um, a loch. So this was like oh, holes, yeah. holes on the paper, you mm. know, because that's how memory works. That's why it was, they say like, we have like this, uh, uh, um, bubble memories, you know, is never exact. A yeah. memory is never exact. Yeah. You know, there's always bits of pieces and other pieces are missing. Mm. So exactly that's how I digged out these papers and that's how the, the sentences were still, but there were like totally holes on it and they were like dusty and, and they now framed and, <laughs> and they are part <laughs> of the exhibition. Plus I have the set of prints with the black markers. Plus I have the video, but I cut yeah. it together. And on the video, you just have the matches like. Tch, tch. Yeah. And you even hear it. So, tch, you know, it just, just yeah. doesn't, you see it and it's not burning and it's a loop, mm -hmm. you know? So you have this loop of not burning papers. And then, uh, and then I took the sentences and then I was telling the sentences and that's the sound piece when you're going out, then you hear what everything was happening. And then this video, what I took with my mom from the demo, I also cut it together for a five minute piece where she's telling that I don't remember and I don't remember, <laughs> you know, mm. it's just quite emotional. So the whole tour is very emotional. Okay. Yeah. <sighs> wow. <laughs> Yeah, crazy. <laughs> uh, like, I love it because it's so impactful. And now um, the way you described it to me, uh, well, it makes me want to go in and see the exposition. <laughs> it, so yeah, we hope, hopefully, we, we will see maybe here in Dusseldorf somewhere, I will be able to show it again. Oof. I mean, I, I won with this work, I won um, in, in Wien, uh, there is like a um, portfolio review yeah. every year. Okay. And I showed this work as a portfolio mm. and I became the winner of the portfolio yeah. review. And this work was introduced the Icon magazine, which is the biggest uh, for, for photography and multimedia mm. in, in, uh, in Austria. Austria. Yeah. So it had a little bit of a... And, and there was one creator who really wanted to take it to Tate Modern to the Turbine Hall. Mm. 
But in the Turbine Hall, they can exhibit artists only if they were already in an um, in a um, um, Kunsthalle okay. in, in a um, art, so museum or modern yeah. art or something, you know. And uh, so it's funny, no? this is art politics. So oh, how you are getting, in, yeah, how weird is that? No? So you already have to establish a name to be able to get into an established yeah. uh, museum. But how you can establish a name when you were not in a museum like that? You know, it's like- Sounds like bureaucracy. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> a little bit like, you know. Oh, come on. Yeah, but whatever, right? It's, yeah. I actually, I mean, at, at the end of the, in the end of the day, I really believed in this house yeah. where it was really commissioned to. Mm. This house is really the place where it's supposed So that is the setup, how it you can really show it beautifully. I, even at the, the uh, part of the work was also uh, invited to the um, photographer's gallery in Wien. That mm. was also in Wien a year later. Uh, and... Uh, there was more like a white cube sort of setup, but for example, my part they painted gray, mm. you know. So then it was a little bit stick that, yeah, out of this uh, out of this uh, white cube setup. Although mm -hmm. there they really commissioned, uh, um, or they asked me to to uh, give the the prints. Mm. So the pieces of paper was not part of it. Only the prints was part of it and the video was part of it. Oh, and there is one Polaroid photo, an original one from me and my mom. Oh. Yeah, this also framed and that's how it started actually. That's a little yeah, that's, <laughs> cherry on the top. Yeah, exactly. So, so um, the, the, funnily, how also this work is very flexible to show so you can you can show only parts of it or the whole but i really believe when you have the whole then it has the really full mm. full power <laughs> then you can really understand it as well yeah you or can try. really understand yeah i mean there what i really the best uh, the best experience was a man came to me at Cote de Ville in saint nicholas after the exhibition mm -hmm. and he thanked me to showing this work he said his mother was also abusive and he never had the strength to establish a family because he was thinking that he would be abusive with his kids as well. Oh, I didn't even say that in the house, the last piece, the last piece, which was sort of like a release for the whole thing was in the room with the pieces of paper and which we painted white and you could watch out of the window there was the sound of my son playing on the, in the same bathtub where my mom was putting me under cold water when mm. I was crying. And that was one of the bad memories. And in this house, in this bathtub, my son was singing. He was like two years old and he was singing in this bathtub. And I recorded that and I made it also part of this exhibition, sort of like, and the, and the title was Breaking the Chain. Mm. because that's what they say then actually it's really like that then people from abusive parents will, will be self-abusive so sort of like it's they are continuing this chain it's yeah. very very hard to break this chain because this is like social uh, socialization you are socializing into this behavior mm -hmm. that's why my mom was abusive he was also beaten up from by her, her mom yeah. you know it's just like and I broke the chain, you know, so I was, and maybe exactly these pieces of artwork was able to give me this possibility yeah. to break this chain. And he was coming to me and he said he was, just loves this because, because he sees then it's, then it's possible to break the chain, you know, you are able to, you just have to talk about it. So yeah. he was not able to talk about this. He doesn't hope. Yeah, exactly. So it is like it really shows to people you're not alone. Yeah. It happens with other people as well. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing that you are just getting out from your system, you know, it's like yeah. get it out, you know. I love how the exposition itself is also part of the story. Yeah. As you just said. Yeah. Like it's it's another like if not the last tool for you to actually accomplish that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
it's really it seems very interesting now how the exhibition also becomes then something which is like you already see then it's working further mm -hmm. so you meta know? yeah it's so meta yeah <laughs> damn okay okay nice <laughs> i love that you told us um this project and how it worked and what it means um i also i remember uh, you tell me as well about this uh, project you had uh, recently. Oh yeah, yeah. This is was like uh, Hungary. Yeah, that was now. I was doing this actually like uh, two weeks ago, mm -hmm. maybe or three weeks ago. There was uh, this little village here in Brandenburg in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, Rekentin. It's really like a, a tiny village with three hundred uh, inhabitants, oh, wow. and there you can find the academy. Uh, for sufficiency mm -hmm. it's a very nice couple is running this place um the corina vossa is the, um um a cultural researcher and um and sh she actually it is her idea and it is it is like um was a it was a farm they bought and they turn it into this totally uh, sustainable place of living. You mm -hmm. know, she's mainly also researching uh, non-development societies. So uh, the societies which are not based on constant financial and economical ex expansion, you know. Yeah, expansion. So... Uh, um, and they are doing an artist residency yeah. in uh, 2019. I was selected to this residency and uh, I really love the place. And they said to me, if I want, I can come back. Mm -hmm. And other times as well, I just have to write to them. And uh, last year I was also there and I was creating some work that was more about um, human and nature and digitalization and nature and mm. human. So this triangle of nature, human and digital world. And this year I was there only for a very short period, but I already had an idea uh, about this uh, sort of moving sculpture. So it's a performance. So yeah, it's like around a year ago, performance also came in. So then, then it was really when you start to realize, you know, like you start to be like um, inter or they're multi. So it's one, one is not enough anymore. So you sort of have to switch between different forms of art mm. you know and so, you realize how powerful that actually is yeah exactly and then and, and i realized but body is a live art body to use the body i realized then body is for i really believe that nowadays for audience is very very hard to understand art mm. you know so sort of you have to so have a sort of art education <laughs> to to be able to understand contemporary art yeah and uh but body performance, this is the only one experience what every human being has in this earth, that we live our life in a body. Yeah. And so that's why I really believe that maybe this is easier to understand when someone is moving. So when, when it's performed. Yeah. And, um, and uh, last year in Portugal, um, I started to develop this idea of this moving sculpture. Mm -hmm. And I took the, uh, the, um, the image of the, um, uh, the freedom statue uh, in Budapest. Mm -hmm. uh, so not the Statue of Liberty, what everyone knows, no? but the freedom statue in Budapest. It's a very, very interesting statue because actually it was created after uh 45 and the russians the soviet union came into mm. hungary and freed us from the <laughs> from the from the nazis yeah we can say you know and it was celebrating the soviet union so it was actually a soviet monument and then after the democratic changes, they removed the Soviet soldiers and they left only the female figure mm. uh, uh, as um, the freedom statue. 
So that's also sort of, it's a very interesting um, how the connotation, how the meaning of, of a sculpture with time and interpretation can change. But sort of it is like a sort of like a symbol of Budapest, a symbol of Hungary. Everyone knows in him who was who was once in Budapest for sure seen this. It's really uh, it's it's really staying above the city, mm -hmm. and it's really nice. Although although at that time when it was creating, there was this little anecdote about it that the people at that time they all said like, uh, because the woman is is holding a palm uh, leaf mm -hmm. in the hand up and they said it looks like a fish so <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> what did you catch it's good <laughs> you know <laughs> uh and and uh, but now, uh, also like uh, already my generation so i know it only only from books you know so yeah. al already in my generation this is not a living knowledge this is only a living knowledge for the older generations okay. And, uh, so this, this, I find, I find this statue is already representing, uh, very much, not just my country and mm. the city where I'm coming from, but also this political change and how politics can be interpreted or how politics can interpret things in another way. So, so it has, has a sort of this, um, ambiguity itself, you know, it's very, sort of surreal in a way, you know, how politic is able to work mm -hmm. and then sort of giving other meanings for things. Very subjective. Yeah. So, yeah, it's exactly. So it is an interpretation of things. So there was something which was staying for something, created for something, and then they take this meaning and they put another meaning on it, sort of like a, a so, post-it. Yeah, <laughs> you know? so it fits their interest. Exactly, so it fits their interest. Okay. And I was creating this, um, so I'm taking this female uh, figure in this um, sort of floating gown and the hands up. Uh, and I took uh, this sort of, and also sort of representing freedom, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I took it to Portugal at first for, um, for a cliff. And... Uh, and and I took this um, bandage, so so satin bandage, uh, in the color of blue, which is also stays for freedom. Mm -hmm. And I sort of created this uh, floating sculptural figure, a, a moving a moving sculpture. You know, mm -hmm. it's a moving sculpture okay. actually. And I, then I took this uh, idea to Rekentin. And actually, I'm really hoping that I will be able to take this image from in different parts of the world mm -hmm. with this blue bandage, and which is like floating in the wind, and create this moving statue everywhere, sort of speaking for the freedom of Hungary. Because... Uh, because I really believe then Hungary is now in a situation when it, it is very, very important uh, that not just that somehow it is, is it, we have to fight for, for the freedom from Hungary because although we are in a democracy, it is a latent democracy. So this, this is really a reflection of the cu uh, current political situation in Hungary where the autonomy of the universities were taken, where the finance for alternative theaters were taken, mm -hmm. where the art cinema chain was destroyed, you know, so the financing and support was taken. So it is really like it is centrally the culture is demolished, you know, and, and then then everything is centralized, just mm -hmm. as was in the communism. You know, only that is allowed, what the government allows, 
And of course, it is like not a censorship in a way Then they say you are not allowed to say this or that. No, they are just simply pulling out the financial uh, support. Mm -hmm. Like at this moment, there is no alternative theater is able to get uh, financial support, only theaters with a building, mm. you know, and in Hungary, I mean, you, you would be able to see the theater, the alternative theater scene. It's very vivid and it's amazing. And they were getting so many prices mm. in whole Europe on theater festivals, you know, so it's like really in a very, very high level. Yeah. You know, but it is also alternative, it's open. So they are like talking about themes, what maybe the uh, current government doesn't want to see. Yeah. Just as much they don't want to see in our books or whatever about homosexuality, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why this whole rainbow movement uh, in Hungary and not just in Hungary, but um, yeah. we were able to see on in the... European cup. Uh, cup, yeah, you know, then people when the Hungarian team was playing, then the people were all all, all with this rainbow colored flags and masks, and yes. you know, so it's like this is a shame on Hungary. <laughs> really, it is like the first time in my life I'm I'm shaming to be Hungarian. It mm -hmm. never ever happened with me before. I was always proud. I went. I was proud to be Hungarian because of this thousand year old culture. You know, I always amazed how the Western part of Europe sort of trying to erase the history of the Eastern part of Europe, you know, then here in West, you don't learn anything about the East. Although, sure. although our history is attached since thousand years, mm -hmm. you know, like Hungary was one of the biggest country from the Black Sea Till the Black Woods in the seventeen um, hundreds, they were all marrying with each other. You know, mm. they've actually, you know, they were the Anjou's, the Habsburgs. You know, the the it doesn't matter the the French, the uh, the Austrians. They were all marrying with each other. You know, exactly to to that was one part of they fought with each other or they married each other. <laughs> and that was the two way they were uh, actually sort of cutting Europe into parts, you know, and then dividing the land, you yeah. know. And, uh, and, uh, and also in Hungary in the 1700s came the first law in the whole world, in the whole world when, when it was a religious freedom given to everyone mm -hmm. to practice their own religion, doesn't matter what of a, a sort of a religion is that, freely. You know, it's, that was so innovative, you know, and I was, I'm, I'm proud of this Hungary. I'm proud of this hang Hungary, which was giving us these great photographers. I'm proud of this Hungary who had these amazing authors and poets uh, in history. You know, it's really going back, I mean, thousand was the year of the... Um, the, when the first king of Hungary was crowned in thousand. So it is like we are talking about more than thousand year of history in this mm -hmm. country. And the Hungarians came, I mean, there are different, uh, different uh, theories, but for 1800, they were already there where they are now. Uh, but some theory says that they were already coming in two waves and they were already um 600 so a couple hundred years before already there mm -hmm. you know where they are now and uh, so this is like a country with a, a long and great history with a lot of amazing achievements like Semmelweis you know with that the doctors nowadays washing their hands uh and the women are and they are sterilizing and stuff this this is the Semmelweis, Ignaz Semmelweis was a Hungarian doctor, you know, who was there telling that we should maybe wash our hands and all the women would not die after they gave birth. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like just so many things in our history, what we can be proud of as Hungarians. And then, and then comes one 
this one person yeah. comes this one person you know and who gets as the first european minister president on the blacklist of of the uh, the world journal uh, journalist organization they have a blacklist about uh, like the freedom of 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 freedom of speech actually you know the freedom of the media yes and and the and then our minister president, the first one from Europe who got to this list because mm -hmm. he actually for, uh, he's actually erased, uh, opposition media in Hungary. Mm -hmm. I mean, he tries, he tries, you know, so like club radio, they went online. They didn't get a frequency anymore. So they are like all the radios, they have to have a frequency to be able to send their, uh, um program yeah and it's it's always like sort of like given from the government it gives these mm -hmm. frequencies and the opposition radios didn't get a frequency mm. yeah so yeah to stream yes so now they're streaming you know so it's like uh it is like what's going on it's like uh for sure and this, this is a government which calls itself nationalist, you know, so the Hungarian history and we are Hungarians and they, we are like uh, we are, uh, 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 drumming on our chest, you know, <laughs> just, uh, and then they are like actually spitting on the Hungarian yeah. history, which were giving the religious freedom as the first one. So actually, in my point of view, when we see this, then Hungary is supposed to be the first country in whole Europe, which will not be anymore because there were already others who are like saying like marriage between uh, the same genders is allowed and it is accepted by law. Yeah. You know, that would be to go with our Hungarian history. You know, in my point of view and sure. in my eyes, you know, so it's like, so that's why I'm creating this Hungarian freedom figure yeah. everywhere. That moves. Yeah, everywhere when I'm going. And uh, it is like also like with, um, I cannot get everywhere a, a palm leaf. So, <laughs> you know, because the True. original, yes. I cannot get everywhere a palm leaf. And I also believe that some, somehow we have to like, it is like, for me, visually, this bandage, which is floating in the air, mm. it's more representing freedom for me, you know, letting your bandage to fly away and, yeah. and then you let it flow in the, in the, in, in, in the wind simply. Okay. So that's, that yeah. was the last one <laughs> that I created. Yeah, okay. But you're still trying to promote and make it uh, a moving exhibition. Okay. Yes, yes. So this is, that's why it's also very nice with performance because you can just go and do. Yeah. You know, I was also able to walk in Berlin in a corset, you know, this, the police came and asked like, what's that? And I said, it's a performance. That's okay. Then welcome. So, <laughs> so till, till I'm not doing it, I don't know, in a country there, uh, uh, it's uh, forbidden, mm -hmm. you know, I, it's all fine. So here in Europe, I'm safe. <laughs> so it actually it's really, and, and there are like really some countries and especially some cities which are very open to art, you know, and, uh, and I really believe in Dusseldorf, Köln, you know, so Berlin anyway, yeah. you know, so here in Germany, it is very nice to make art. Because we are plagued and, and history also with uh, tons of artists that are coming in and out. And this is especially known yeah. for its uh, photography scene. Yeah, exactly. And also when you just uh, uh, say like Joseph Boyce, you know, there is the anniversary this year. So there's everywhere like uh, boys exhibitions around. Boys? Yeah. Just I don't know that one. You don't know Joseph Boyce? Oh. Sorry. I mean, he is really in performance. So he's like, this is, I mean, here in Dusseldorf, most of the people know boys. Okay. Maybe I should leave them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave you to it. <laughs> yeah. um, they have an uh, exhibition uh, at the um, Kunstsammlung mm -hmm. right now in Krefeld as well uh, in the museum they have. Um, pretty sure 
I mean, oh, the university, the Heinrich Heine University has like sort of like, um, it is more, um, more talk. It's, I know it was like Zoom, but it was very interesting. I've seen the first part. Uh, so it's a lot of, a lot of things going on in boys was really way above his own era with his art. So he was one of the artists here in Düsseldorf who was kicked out from the Düsseldorf Academy or wanted they, they wanted to kick him out because he was he was a performance artist and um and the people simply didn't understand what he's doing. Mm -hmm. You know, so simple is that they had n they had mainly no clue what 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 his art <laughs> is about. Going on here? Exactly. But that's that's what I'm saying like these artists are opening the doors. So that's why I always say that not white cube and not mainstream art is changing the world. Alternative art is changing the world. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why I like alternative places you know, or that's why I like uh, public places, you know, like, like in, in show, f uh, show windows or, you know, in the stores or on the street or in a park or, or, or somewhere, you mm -hmm. know, somewhere which is not a gallery and not a museum. No. Just out of our, what we're used to. Yeah, exactly. And, and also places which where I really believe that most of, most of the artists, they are doing art because they have to somehow. So it's just sort of like you have this need, you, you know, like if I'm not able to do art, I'm like sick, you know. And But the other uh, thing is that you want to show your mm -hmm. art. But mm -hmm. where you show your art is most of the artists, is, I think it doesn't really matter, you know. And then some artists who really want to earn a lot of money and then, not, uh, then of course, you have to somehow get into the mainstream because oh, that's where art says although nowadays even there is this book that you can sell a lot of art online <laughs> and you don't even have to sh have one show <laughs> and you can do that no yeah definitely the the showcasing uh areas are going online now exactly and that was for example a very interesting uh, change of corona on the art world you know that suddenly suddenly everyone went online yeah. and that gives way more possibilities for artists to show their work yeah. you know so for example i have a friend he created the uncube gallery oh. so we are talking about white cubes so nice. that's why this is uncube we are uncubing mm -hmm. and uh, it's really an amazing concept what she's doing it's an online gallery and it's um also created in a totally different manner because she was selecting six artists who she knew mm -hmm. and liked. Mm -hmm. And then the six artists had an exhibition and the six artists then recommended wow. six other artists. Yeah, so nice, the, nice. You know, and that's how it goes further. Yeah. So it is like going through artists recommending artists. And, um, and then after the first year, she made the retrospective uh, and then the exhibition opening was a, uh, a streaming and I was then doing their, um, a multimedia performance streamed yeah. from my room, which was also like amazing experience to sort of prepare for this. You know, it is also inspiring because mm. you are sort of have to uh, change your mind how, okay, my space yeah, now is the screen. Yes. And then how it will work in the screen setup, you know, you don't have this room anymore where people are walking in. So mm -hmm. there you have to talk about, to somehow set up From this 3D to yes, 2D. 2D, 2D, exactly. Then how that works. I have to adapt that experience. Yeah. But I, lo I love that um, idea of um, un unboxing. Yeah. Um, because, well, it, it breaks boundaries within the world within the word and also it breaks this uh chain of ed um, elitistic way of ex um, exposing your artwork exactly that's what i really believe and the concept is really really amazing and innovative and actually that's how art world supposed to work 
it's just not working because uh, like that because everything has sort of like a business part that, that's you know what she's doing is exactly the opposite what tate uh modern is doing mm -hmm. where you can get in only when you were already like in a big ass exactly. uh, art hall i was thinking about that exactly <laughs> it's it's no no yes you can come in in uncube because an artist thinks then your artwork is amazing mm -hmm. you know and i really believe that also artists understand other artists way better so th that's where you also like joseph boyce was very much appreciate appreciated by his artist colleagues mm -hmm. you know they understood what he was doing yeah you know so your scenery understands what you are doing you know and 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 I really believe also then, and then the other thing is like, now I, we were sitting here and I had like a lot of nice time to explain, for example, my project yes. in Coupe de Ville. Mm -hmm. Okay, how I'm doing a portfolio about it. <laughs> like really seriously, like how I'm yes. presenting it. You know, I could really, that's why it was getting this portfolio review because there I was sitting one-on-one -on, -one on curators mm. and I was telling the story and the guy just asked me who loved the story, just like, is it a true story? And I said, yes, of course it's a true story. <laughs> you know, and he's like, okay, this is amazing. Yeah. You know, it's just, but it really is. But that's how you need this personal meeting and relationship yeah. that, they see what you are showing. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm showing then when, because in a portfolio, you cannot walk in, you know, you know, it was yeah. also interesting in the curator of Coupe de Ville, this, uh, Stefan Bellingen is really also an amazing person. He also, um, um, I asked how was the um, resonance and he said like, this was really too, two part two ex uh, two works which was getting a lot of feedback yeah, on one tension. of them is was mine yeah. so it doesn't matter if people like it or hate it but they all remembered it you know so yeah of course i mean that's how i think that is important i mean you cannot it's for i'm, I'm certain and it also a lot of people can be too much you know it's just too much emotions you know it's just too much drama, <laughs> but, uh, but they will never forget what they've seen. No, it's and very they, impactful. Yeah. And they, and they think about it, mm. you know, and then I think this is the most important. That's what art's supposed to do to sort of make people think about issues, what they maybe would not think about. Yes. That's why I really believe nowadays art is more important as journalism because journalism before was really trying to show issues from an objective perspective. Mm -hmm. But let's be honest. I mean, now with the online media and with this, uh, for example, what you are doing and podcast, you know, yeah. there's no one influencing you, what you are showing. You are the editor and you decide what you are showing but when you yeah. see again mainstream journalism newspapers televisions they all belong to a political agenda mm. but people don't know about it yeah. you know the normal people watching television watching the news and they have no clue of this is like right or left or in which from which political party this uh, belongs uh, to belongs to yeah. you know but they all belong to somewhere you know yes and the people don't know about it and uh, but art is different because art everyone knows is subjective you know so so you don't have to pretend you are objective no because everyone knows this is an artist this is a subjective point of view mm -hmm. on a theme doesn't matter what you show, you know, but it makes you think, you know, then you, you know, so you take a look and you say like, oh, okay, I haven't thought about this in this way. So how it was shown to me, you know, this problem or this political issue, this social issue, uh, this part of the world I yeah. haven't seen. So you are, you are actually watching something through another person's eye. 
you know, yeah. you are, I really believe, and that's why it would be very important and people are, the art is, is getting really closer to people. So people really understand what they see in mm. one way or in another way, or, or, or art education is a little bit more often and it doesn't stop somewhere in modern art. Mm. but goes a little bit further then the people have a more a little bit more understanding what they they see mm. or we artists has to some somehow get out there you know and then talk to people you know and that's why i really love when you are doing a performance on the street yeah then people coming to you and asking you what's that <laughs> why are you doing questions. that exactly and then you have exactly this uh, relationship built up which is missing mm. In a way, you're helping out uh, the broader audience to uh, get me educated yeah. in this matter and to get used to seeing this type of um, showcasing of projects, of art projects, and, um, and understanding them. And I love how you compared art to um, journalism in a way where the conclusion could be that art is in a way more honest. I really believe that art is more honest. Yeah. I and really, this, uh, this is my conclusion that art is more honest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. I've known, I like, like, like I've never heard or seen it like that before. Like, I don't know. It's for me, it's the first time. Yeah. I'm, well, <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> nice. No, yes. But uh, at the same time, even talking about these projects, um, not only gets the audio audience educated on it that are not in in the art industry, but artists as well that are in it. Yeah, and opening up their perspectives as well. Yeah, exactly. And then this is very very important. You know, we cannot be this ivory tower artist. We cannot uh, create art for art's sake. You know, this is all old stuff mm -hmm. you know it was privatized and we yeah, make it. We, somehow <laughs> we, we stepped over it so i really believe that art is very interesting nowadays it's very very nice to see art nowadays and sink into this world and then see different sort of arts and uh and i have a, a great luck that i'm going to these artist residencies or whatever events like uh it was very nice in 2020 in Venice, in the Venice Biennale was the um, performance art week. And I was lucky enough to be part of it. It was 20 artists from all over the world. And it, it was an amazing experience. You know, it is like, it, it is changing you. It's simply changing you as a person. This experience is not enough that you are also getting all of the, uh, these friends, these great relationships, like really deep relationships, you know, and then, and then you have really this, this huge circle of artists, friends from all over the world. Yeah. And then, then when in Hong Kong, all the riots were going on because of China, yeah. you know, and I could ask my Chinese artist friend, mm. and how do you see that? You know, this is like firsthand experience, you know, what, what is coming. So you are like, you know, and artists are functioning like that. So are the artists are like, they have a huge network of art, other artists, you know, that's simply, that's how, because you go to an exhibition or you are exhibiting your work somewhere, or you are going to an artist residency or, so we also travel a lot. Mm. Somehow, somehow I think that belongs to being an artist that you travel and move around a lot. And then you are meeting a lot of other artists. We are sort of, I always say we are nerds. We are art nerds, you know, so we are, we have to talk with other artists. If you are not able to talk to other artists, then you like, after a while you feel like no one understands what I'm saying. <laughs> Everyone <know? laughs> sees just crazy. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's just no one understands. And then, then suddenly you are with the artist and you feel like, oh, finally, <sighs> we can talk about art again. And, and, uh, like-minded and, uh, people. Exactly, like-minded people, exactly. So you, I think as an artist, you need this artist net. It's also- Yes, it's healthy. It's, yeah, it's very healthy. <laughs> and it's also very inspiring. 
that is that's also very nice you know that how artists are inspiring the, each other with the thoughts you know so this is i think this is very essential it mm. is very essential to the life of of, of of an artist of some sort yeah i mean when it comes to us um it's rather photography and now multimedia because it's i mean uh, what i can see or like um, take as a common common member in in the projects you've done so far or the ones you've told me about it's mainly about um showcasing sort of like conflict yeah in a way yeah um so it's it's more of like i don't know if criticism will be the right word A social, a social criticism for sure is inside. Yes. Mm. Especially more, uh, especially on one side, it is about memory a lot. So my personal works, it's very bi autobiographical and they mm. are also like very memory based and everything what I'm doing on the, uh, on the other line is this a human nature, digital word. Mm. This is very much social criticism. Yes. Like, like sort of uh sort of to be, to to it's a hard hard to say like that the open people's eyes to to see things mm -hmm. you know to see that what's going on around them yeah, you're you screaming know? at them yeah sort of sort <laughs> of like hey open your eyes don't you see you know what's going on around you you mm -hmm. know we are we are like sinking into digital world in one yeah. side and uh, and we are killing our planets and uh, and i don't know it was uh, for me shocking when i was at, at the academy of sufficiency and there was another artist She's 29 years old and she said the human being will be anyway dying out. So this is, this. I don't know how you see because you are even younger, but the, really the young generations, I, as, a, as this, in this age, even nowadays, I would never think of this, you know, that the human being will die out and yeah. even in 3000 years. So she said like 3000 years and we are gone. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I've thought about it, but yeah. like... I'd rather not believe that, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, yeah. So, But it doesn't seem that unlikely. Come yeah, on. exactly. So that's the, <laughs> that's the problem, you know, that you are really like looking around, you know, how nature is like... Uh, yeah, king is, out. It's really <laughs> pushing really, really hard, yeah. uh, reflecting on what's going on, what the hu human being is doing with the earth and how earth is reacting to it. So it's really much... You know, this really makes a lot of thoughts, you know, that maybe we should really change our minds very fast or, or, or I don't know what comes, you know, we're gone. I mean, this is, that's the problem if, of me, the human being, then we can think only on 80 years, which is nothing. And then you are not, not really able to think over this 80 years and yeah. we have to here think in hundreds of years or even more. That was a very interesting uh, film, what I've seen about um, atomic garbage, how you are um, marking mm -hmm. atomic garbage, so which are coming from the um, nuclear, plants. Nuc nuclear plants yeah, and the nuclear garbage, how you are marking it yeah. because it's radiating for 10,000 years. So how you are marking something on earth for the next generations, for the next 10,000 years. I mean, you cannot As just, you, you cannot put in a sign, nu nuclear garbage <laughs> is, uh, is uh, digged here, you know. Well, so. they, won't, they won't forget it. <laughs> exactly, so, you, know, you know. They're marking these places are uninhabitable, like radically, yeah, it's for just, such a long time. Exactly, so how? But you have to somehow, mm. because in the next maybe in 100 or 200 years, an investor comes and just puts up a project no. here, you know, you know, so <laughs> you understand what's the problem. Yeah. Okay. Come on. I think they will like do proper research. <laughs> I don't know. Come on. 
<clears throat> you know, mm. that's the problem and it's about money. They don't research, you know, True. they were already putting like houses on garbage, uh, yeah. deep on They don't have to live there, right? So. Yeah, exactly. You know, they, <laughs> they, just, don't care. they don't care. They don't have to live there. They are getting their money. So who? Who cares, yeah. you know? So that's why it's like, so there are some, there are some interesting questions still, you know, and I'm sort of like, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe because I'm also, I also have a kid. So it's sort of like a little bit worrying the future mm. of my son as well, you know? So it's like really sort of when you have already kids, then you start to think as a parent, what I'm leaving behind for these, the next generations yeah. and the next generations, you know? You're becoming less uh, self-centered in a way. Yeah, for sure. For uh -huh. sure. <laughs> yeah. Just, you Sh cannot afford it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I get what you mean. Um, I, see us, I see it in a similar way as um, artists in general are individuals that need and should focus on on their surroundings and on their environment, how that change, how that is changing, and and in the direction between you and it, yeah. And it's vital for for artists to be up to date and to study history and understand all those different tendencies we are going through. Yeah, and I mean, at first, I have to say, like, I know that a lot of people maybe they still have this uh, image about artists, you know, this seventies image somewhere, uh, with, the uh, on drugs and on, on alcohol, like <laughs> laying on the, in the corner, you know, some sort of, of are. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> but yeah, are so. <laughs> yeah, but they, these are also the artists, they will never really do it to yeah. be real artists because like art is really like sort of like a business. So you have to be very focused and the, and I have to tell you an artist makes a lot of research. So, so I, I mean, no, when I'm doing a work, even my work is absolutely not research based, but after I made this, um, work in Kutzeville and I recognized that my mom has, uh, dementia, dementia, mm -hmm. you know, I was reading everything that I could read. I've read like, I don't know, hundred pages who reports that's the world health organization, about mental illnesses and their impact on families. And, uh, and, uh, when I was uh, doing my artwork about, um, and how, how cloud clouding, then we, everything putting up on cloud, then how much energy it takes actually, you know, I was like, I was reading so much, you know, this is, and also I was now in this one week, one of the artists I was talking and she has also a very, very interesting work about um, um, funeral, mm -hmm. um, um, ecological funeral. So how can be a funeral be a, more a, environmentally friendly? Uh, exactly. Okay. <laughs> how uh, more environmentally friendly? Exactly. That's perfect. Uh, and she said to me, oh man, I was reading so much about the theme. So mm. researching so much, and I really have to take a break now to put all of this, what I read then to be an artwork, you know, so it accumulates an enormous amount of knowledge yeah. about the themes, what artists then are putting into these artworks, mm. you know, even mm. then if it's just a drawing. You know, till this drawing com comes, you know, what you want to draw, this is like an amazing amount of knowledge, what you're accumulating, plus everything, what you learned in your whole life, you know, which leads, I really believe that every artwork is sort of like accumulates what everything, what you gained till that point in your life, you know, and then you are really putting a lot of knowledge like so much in different themes, you know, so what you have done. <laughs> yes, exactly. So like really sometimes I'm like, I read so much about psychology. I read so much about, oh, the social impact of immigration just because I made a photo series, you know, and then I was like, really like uh, researching mm. what is actually what means 
immigration yeah, and, and, and what yeah. are the psychological impacts of the people who are migrating yeah. and, you know so uh and uh so this really uh, that's that doesn't exist anymore and then even even when you just want to organize your exhibitions and public spaces even if it's a square mm -hmm. or it's it's a, a an empty industrial building you know doesn't matter yeah that to organize, you know, because all of these places now, so, or this, you know, these artist run places, you know, there's a lot of artist run places. I mean, to organize these places, it's not less work as organizing a gallery, or even if it's their big, it's not less as organizing a museum, you know, it is just don't have the financial support that mm -hmm. these places have, mm -hmm. or they are not working on a commercial ba base. Sure, but no? there's still a lot but of energy and work. Exactly, in the there is like it's a lot to organize and yeah. a lot of energy and a lot of work what are going into these places, you know. So that's why you know this. Uh, everyone who wants to be an artist because then he can have a party like forget about it you know that word is over you know this is like you no, know you can motivate <laughs> everyone come on yeah this is like yeah for the future generation of artists you know when you think that then you can have together with people you can drink and yeah. use drugs no <laughs> <laughs> sad reality just the sad reality kicks in. you know the sad reality that it's hard work you know hard work and un mostly unpaid you know <laughs> yeah no, yes yes that one hurts even more <laughs> yeah i mean i'm saying like it is actually quite unfair that art is paying for that that actually art exists in the world mm. you know so that's it we have this cultural part which is like called art then you know there was also very interesting that was a project from an artist who made a study uh, how many artists are able to living from art oh. yes so 60 percent is paying for the art that they are doing art mm. 30 percent is breaking even and 10 percent is able to earn money with it you know so then <laughs> that's the sad reality yeah. you know which means, you know, that really 60% of the artists, and even when you break even, you know, this... Yeah. Uh, but for some reason, that just doesn't surprise me at all. No, it's not surprising. I mean, I really believe that it is the same in music business, you know, and there is a lot of like this... So I really believe like artists, doesn't matter what sort of artist, of it's music or or film or, mm. or, or, or visual arts, or doesn't matter what yeah. part of the art, like really... 90% is paying for that, that it exists in this world, yeah. you know, and then the 10% is, is w w about art business is about, you know, living the dream. Yeah. I mean, that is also, but that is also, you know, I have an artist friend and he is selling very well art, mm -hmm. really good, mm -hmm. you know, but to be able to do that, he has to have two assistants. And he's already represented with galleries and, you know, like the, the images, what he's doing, like going for 10, 15,000 euro per piece, you know, so it's like serious, serious. I mean, he's like earning over 300,000 euros per year, mm -hmm. you know, which mm -hmm. is like a big amount of money. Yeah. But for this, of course, he has to pay taxes and he has to pay the two assistant and he has to pay his studio. Mm. And at the end of the day, he's not able to pay his taxes, you know, because his costs are so high to yeah. be able to get this money in. So, like, I'm really asking, like, how fucking feel you have to earn as an artist that you really... Able, yeah, how big you need to get. How big you have to get. How big, really. <sighs> how big you have to get, yeah. you know. Or how dead you have to be. <laughs> you know, it's like seriously, you die and then suddenly everything goes up. Yeah. I feel like that, um, those percentages you just gave mm. uh, from uh, the study mm. just resembles really how valued art is in society. Yeah. Or for the government. In yeah, that exactly. Sense. Um, it's just an accurate way of, uh, um, it portrays, you know, yeah. um, how much it gets invested in from public funding. 
Yes. And if we are not just talking about public funding, we are also talking about a big part of art business because some, some people are really getting uh, rich on this. Most part of the pie, yeah. No? So they are like, they are really, really people who are really getting very, very rich on on yeah on art, you know. So there is like this public funding. I mean, that's the other thing is like, I'm, what I never really understood there are some companies or like private funding. So in the mm. United States, is this, uh, it's a very little public funding. It's a, a big piece of private funding. So mm. there's also for a lot of companies, it's a prestige to found. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, they will found mainly big um, institutions, you know, but there is sort of like a heritage of it to do this. Yeah. Here in Europe, it is more public funding. And that's I never understand here in Europe. Why is it like that? Because here in Europe, we really have companies who are making so much profit, mm. you know, and and uh, how our taxing is built up, then there is this limit of 55,000 euro and above that is only one key for the taxing, mm -hmm. you know, but there are people who are getting like 2 million a month. You know, and mm -hmm. it pays the same as the person who gets 65,000, which is like a big difference. Yeah. You know, so, and I don't understand then, especially with big companies with a lot of profit, why they are not forced to finance culture. You know, so, yeah. so, so somehow, somehow, although even now it is tax reductible. Yeah. So you are, if you are like spending money, you are donating money, you know, you can take mm. it off from your, but somehow to really motivate it. Like in Brook, I mean, it was in Boston. Mm. That's why Boston has the most public uh, sculptures because every investor who builds a building mm. has to finance a sculpture for the public space. Yes. No, so such things, mm. you know. But oftentimes, actually, when you see very wealthy people, um, let's say, purchase art or um, invest in art in some way, oftentimes it goes because of their own benefit because they save taxes doing that. Yes. Yeah. That, that's why. That's why sometimes a big they painting also, costs yeah. like. They also supposed to do millions that. Millions and millions. Yeah. The problem is, you know, that they are also most of the time investing in something, but they know or known, you know, so yeah. known art. This is all mainstream art. They will go into a gallery and they will buy it from a gallery, yes. you know. In an auction, public auction. Exactly. Or private. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. There was something I wanted to say. I was just... It's just gone. It's just gone. <laughs> Never mind. I wanted to. Well, I love the 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 rail, the trail uh, we run through um, through your life until now, uh, through different um, time periods, places you've worked at, expositions, projects. I think it was very complete. <laughs> I was delighted to listen to all, all of that, especially to the project projects part and have you explain them um that's really nice uh, I, I just wish there was like like some graphic <laughs> uh, like extra to that while i'm listening like oh and then i just see the pictures um now i would love to touch with you as well on some practical tips and um, ideas we could share for colleagues, young people like myself, um, in order to succeed in this area. Let's say photography, but let's keep it uh, as general as possible within the arts. Not only like you talked about expositions a lot, so maybe we can focus a little bit on that. And what would you tell a, a young person to? Um, get their, their work exposed and shown? I mean, I would say everywhere where it's possible. So they are supposed to see every space as a possibility to expose art. And I'm really mean it. You know, I, I really believe that the most important thing is that you, you 
make continuously art. And then what I can absolutely recommend is really portfolio reviews that work for me very well. That makes Arl, for example, the Arl Festival in, in ah, yes. then the Kaunas Photo Festival in Lithuania. I did not, I don't know that one. <laughs> uh, it's very nice. It's, it's for a couple of years runs and it's, it's, it's very, very good. The Kaunas Photo Festival, then the portfolio review in Vienna in every year. Oh, um, oh, also, also, um, Warp. They are organizing the Coup de Ville. They have an artist village. I can recommend, you know, they are all people. Okay. There you have to invest some money. But the money is really worth the investment. Also, uh, for for to be more clear about your project, you know. So especially if 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 you are in a stage where you don't know if it's good or good enough or is it edited enough, then then these are the portfolio reviews where you are getting an amazing feedback from art professionals. Mm -hmm. Very valuable. For, exactly. So for museum directors, from curators. So for example, this project then developed where it developed, uh, which was exhibited at Coup de Ville. Yeah. That was really, I went to Artist Village mm -hmm. and I had raw material. I had complete raw material and I showed only the raw material. And I was in the week, I was sitting, I don't know, with 20 people. That's yeah. one week long. And every week, every day you are sitting, I don't know, with five people. Yeah. You know, it's very intense, you know. And then makes you clear also what is important for you, what is not. So, of course, you are getting like different point of views. So yeah. sometimes like totally opposite point of views. And then it makes us think and they say, no, I want it like this. Yeah. Even when they say, no, that's not good. This is like, and they say, no. Then it also makes you strong about what you are doing, that you exactly know in which direction you want to mm. go with the artwork. Mm. And I don't want to tell her about it. That, for example, from this artist village, actually the organizer invited me to then Coup de Ville. Mm. He said, I want to commission this work for the next Coup de Ville. Exactly like that, that from the Vienna portfolio view, then the exhibition in the photographer's gallery, gallery in Wien, well, I was invited there because of this portfolio yeah. review. So, so from every portfolio review I went, an exhibition came at the end. You know, and of course, a set of people, it's a good network. You know, these people will all give you their email address so mm. you can keep them updated what you are doing, you know. So that I can really, really recommend. Then the other thing is like every online possibility, which is there. Or there is Saatchi Gallery, for example, Fine Art America, uh, Hub. Mm. It's a new one I've just heard about. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. There are some other uh, other uh, pages. You, know, you really the maybe the younger generations are also more aware as I am. You know what other? Uh, but these are all websites. They are all only dealing with representing art and selling art. Yeah. And they are also they are not taking the commission from you. They are putting it over your price. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you are saying you like want tax. to. Exactly. So <laughs> exactly. So you want to get this money. You are getting that money, what you want from your artwork. Yeah. You know, if someone is buying it, of course, mm -hmm. there is uh, thousands of people, thousands of artists with thousands of artworks. There's always competition. Yeah. But uh doesn't matter. Funnily enough, you know, you can put in what sort of colors you have. So it's a little bit goes into this decorative direction. So what people are looking for color and and theme yeah. and stuff like that. So it is again, for example, for my project would not work at all. Okay. You know, so th this is really good for visual arts. Photography is perfect. And for uh, painting, illustration, that is really everything which someone can hang on a wall. Yeah. No, but for that, it is really perfect. And uh, the portfolio reviews, that's also, this is for everything, you know, this is, oh, I was also showing the work in one Mannheim. They're in Mannheim also a portfolio review. In Mannheim also is a festival, the Mannheim Photo Festival. Oh. I was showing that work. There was also, I was a jury favorite. I was in the 10 <laughs> and they also then offered me that they also have like a platform where they are selling art and then I could put in the other stuff what I showed on the, you can then send there any mm -hmm. sort of 
uh, art what yeah, you do material. you know but they are also like doing marketing and they are doing their newsletters which are send it for don't know thousand ten thousands of people you mm -hmm. know so these are all good good possibilities then i was always looking for listings for exhibition uh, uh possibilities for example call, call for uh kunst here in germany mm, colorful kunst they call it's funnily enough this is like the typical german the half of is it in english the half of it in german <laughs> i was like what <laughs> so this is call for kunst call, call for kunst ah call for kunst call for kunst okay yeah fear, call for kunst mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? so it is like but it is like everything which is german is going on or a little bit also international it's yeah. very good mm -hmm. and there there what i really like about the listing there every possibility is there is free to get in mm. so there is no application fees yeah. you know? so some of the listings what you are getting e-art now i really liked but nowadays everything what they are listing is so have are sort of an application fee mm. which is okay i mean now i will be exhibited in barcelona and that was the um, margaret cameron award that was especially for women photographers. And I had to pay like $15 to be in the competition. Yeah. But then I became jury favorite and I was um, uh, invited to exhibit in Barcelona. So some of them are really worth it. And most bigger um, competitions, let's say, do normally have a fee. Tend. yes yeah yes exactly Mo like most yes. big ones have like the epa uh that also the international photography award very good you know there was i was also getting on already honorable mention mm. oh there are competitions <laughs> and like, they are really, like sand in the ocean <laughs> and they are and they are like and then you can also sort of like because they are like again thousands of people are sending their images yeah Ne? And then, okay, they have everywhere only one category of art who mm -hmm. is getting some money. But I got like honorable mention minimum five times, which gets 20 people from the 4,000. Yeah. You know, this also shows you where, where, you, are. where you are with the image. Totally. You know. And where it's going right now what's the trend exactly and then and then you are also entitled there for example in the international Phot photography award no, this is the Paris Photo Prize, PPP, there, I think there was it. Then you are even getting a seal. So if you're getting an honorable mention, mm -hmm. then you are entitled to download the seal, then you were honorable mention, mm -hmm. and you can really put it on your image, mm -hmm. the seal, you know. As a watermark? Yes. Okay. Exactly. Or next to it, or, you know, okay. so for, for, for sure you can write it everywhere mm -hmm. and you are really getting an official seal, mm -hmm. you know, so there are some, uh, funny things. And then again, you are again in huge, in a huge, um, promotion inside and you never know what comes back from it. Mm -hmm. Like I also haven't thought that from the, um, for the Cameroon award, I will be, uh, invited to the photo biennial in Barcelona. You know, that was totally new for me that it comes with this as honorable mention. I mean, but it's, it's, a, it's a glut. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was totally happy. And why I was happy, oh, that's the other thing is, for example, and network, network, network. So yeah. just collect every telephone number, email address, Instagram, yeah. Facebook, care, whatever. So really the, every people you meet in your way, because... I mean, my very good friend, Kat, we were working together in New York, cool in New York. And yes, she's in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. She just opened a gallery, you know, and then in Barcelona. And then it's, uh, it's, I, I called her, I contacted her because I said like, look, look, Kat, I'm like in December, I will go to Barcelona because I'm in this group show. And for sure for the opening, I'm invited to the gala event 
for the dinner and stuff. So yes. uh, I would like to go. And at first she said right away, yes, and you will live by me. <laughs> you know, so that's what I, was, nice. <laughs> what, what I didn't even expect it, yeah. but it was super nice. And then I said like, look, and what would be if we would set up like an, a, like a solo exhibition at the same time? And she said, no, yeah, at the same time it will not work out, but for January, for sure. <laughs> You know, yes. and then and then in January, then I have a solo exhibition there in Photo Utopia. You know, so you never know. Yeah, yeah, it surprises you more often than not. Yeah, exactly. This was like um, it's it's nice. So the, I really believed, and and I really also believe, and now that I'm spreading out this word for all artists all around the world, we are not concurrent to each other. You know, we're not we, competing. We are not competing with each other. We are not competing because art is so subjective. You cannot really define then it will be you or the next artist. But if we help each other, then everyone will have its possibility to show their work. You know, I really believe that's very, very important that we artists, we see each other as one group. And we fight for our rights <laughs> together. And we see that's why I see each other as, as a community mm -hmm. that helps each other in every way which is possible. It doesn't matter if it's someone is sleeping over on your couch for a couple of days, or you are just recommending, look, I also have this, is I think it would um, also work out for you uh, for the next exhibition as an artist. You know, take a look to the work. So recommend each other's work. Recommend the other artist for everywhere where it is possible. And yeah. if you come back, it's karma. It's good karma. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, the, I love it. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just basically let, let us all work with each other, not against each other. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I think it just makes, uh, I think this is, although I really believe that artwork is basically works like that. Could be more, could be a little bit more and could be a little bit more uh, family friendly, but mm -hmm. it's also changing in the last five years. I see how much it's changed already. Like um, 10 years ago when I got my kid and I looked around, I really couldn't find any artist residency, which wouldn't be like half a year or one year. Mm -hmm. And I was asking like, how you are going away with a kid for half a year? I mean, you cannot leave behind True. your baby for half a year or a year. <laughs> and of course you cannot take the kid with you because it's all for the artist. Yeah. And then suddenly like the short term residency started to appear three months, one mm -hmm. month. Nowadays, even I found two weeks. 10 days. Yeah, they're getting shorter. You know, so I, what I find, it's really amazing because although it's very compact, 10 days or two weeks can mean so much for mm -hmm. an artist to be yeah. able to work concentrated. I mean, I was able in three weeks, I don't know, to finish five artworks suddenly, you know, which was like accumulating for a year in my head. And then suddenly I had three weeks when I could concentrate on these five artworks, totally different stuff. And it's like not, I mean, not totally different, but for really like everything is like a little project, you know, and it was finished. I was able in three weeks to do that. That's also an Instagram I was posting and my friends were like writing me what's going on suddenly, you know, like, choo, 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 choo. Yeah, in, in, <laughs> yeah, exactly. In a mass production, <laughs> come for me, also floating out art. And then again, months is nothing, you know, yeah. like I'm living my everyday life and I'm like sort of accumulating the energy and all yeah. the ideas. And then again, when I have this point, then again, some this is, comes again in, in, in a love band, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know it's called in english but i know what you mean <laughs> so it's uh so that's uh that's also changed and i already seen some residences for mothers with kids mm -hmm. you know before i always felt and there was even articles about it in art magazines then as an artist woman artist you're getting a mother they are writing you down as an artist oh you are a mother you are, you are not an artist anymore. You mm. are in a new category oh. suddenly. You know what? You were in a new uh, drawer. Put it in, in a new drawer. It's not the artist drawer, it's the mother drawer. <laughs> you know? So it's like, 
uh, and that's uh, and this was really in a serious art magazine where they were writing about this mm. this problematic this then it's shame. then it's issue it's this issue then you are not taken seriously anymore uh, although like like really frankly uh, what I feel when I became a mother it just uh, my art be became so feel more deep so mm -hmm. the depth of your thinking it is just it is just grows it grows with this extra that you brought a kid to the world you know it, it is, changes you it changes it's cha you. yeah it absolutely changes you and it is changing you as an artist also in the right direction yeah. so it is like uh, and uh, that's why I was very upset. I have to mm. say, it was really upsetting me, you know, that I, uh, I, as a mother, I felt and I said, yes, I have a son. And suddenly like, oh, okay. <laughs> and it's way the gone, you know, so the horse is closing, you know, it's like, and I was like, what? What's going on? But that's also changing, you know, so it is, uh, so, it, and it's very funny how also the not just as the world changing uh, around us very rapidly you can see this also in the art world inside how it is changing rapidly yeah you know so that's why uh i really believe that we are in an era when we can really make changes very fast you know so somehow mm -hmm. the whole world and the whole life which is also very stressed because of that you know then the, the pressure a lot of pressure a lot of pressure because it's, it's it's really a lot of changes are going on. That's why I'm sometimes um, I'm really asking how older generations are really like uh, being able to adapt, you know, or not adapt. Yeah, it's, you know, uh, at some points quite overwhelming. Yeah, I really believe you know just when you see this digital technology, you know, when technological changes, you are uh, you are. Um, um, taking a look at, mm. you know, you, you see, um, I have sometimes problems to understand what my son is talking about, yeah. you know, yeah. so this is like huge generational gaps are, are there because of this rapid technological change. Yeah. But this has a, a backside and a good side. So the good side exactly. Then you can also change things for the better very fast yeah. with that. But if you if if you stop walking, you'll fall behind very quickly yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, so, uh, um, you know, I'm like really, I'm 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 also this uh, generation X. It's very interesting to be generation X. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a generation. I'm I'm the last generation actually. I'm the last generation who knows the analog world without the digital one. Yes, absolutely without the digital one. So when it was digital was non existed. Yes. In, in the I, era. Exactly. I grew up in an era where was the cassette. Yeah. Was there the tape? Yeah. In English it's the tape. Yeah. You know, was there and even an LP. So I have a whole LP uh, uh, um, collection, yeah. you know. Um and I had no not even I was till I was sixteen. We didn't even had a landline, um, a normal phone mm. in our house. That's then they were bringing it in, which was funny because in sixteen we get the normal telephone, and we have, I was maybe, oh, 77, 20, and there was already the cell phones. No, yeah, so it mm. was. Then suddenly, you know, I uh, then you could run big around bricks. the big, the big bricks. You know, <laughs> so still not was in everyone in the hand. But then, like five years later, yeah, you know, or and then you everyone had it. Yeah, everyone had, had a Nokia. Exactly, everyone <laughs> a had BlackBerry. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, this was like uh, so. So I'm this last generation who knows this word absolutely and also understands. That's why the older generations, so it's sort of, this is this link. Uh, we are the generation is this sort of linking the two worlds together. Mm -hmm. no, but we, we, this generation was young enough 
to be able to completely adapt to the digital world and be able to use it hundred percent, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and uh, that's why this this is a very interesting position to be this generation X. So it's very interesting to be able to see the old world and the new world and compare it. Yeah. You know, coming from the old world and uh, and understanding both worlds. Mm -hmm. You know, and then every generation and older, they have already problem with the with the digital era, yeah. no, yeah. and they are having like real difficulties at parts. Mm -hmm. And then every generation is younger than me. Um, they don't know this anymore. You know, like uh, they have no clue. You know, they 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 don't know what the, did it mean not to have a computer or a, or a cell phone I or take it for granted. Yeah, it's totally granted. They are like totally natives, digital mm. natives, and I'm still an in the digital immigrant. <laughs> these are official words uh, from studies. Okay, I like that. Yeah, no, these I've are. Heard that before. Yeah, these are digital the, immigrant. Yeah, digital immigrant and digital native. I mean, you clearly have a unique view um, about this transition because you have lived in both of them. Yeah, right? you've grown up in one, and yeah, absolutely. Spend your your adulthood in the second. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Recapping. To uh, your to the topic advice. Uh, advice, yeah. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Sorry again. Like, Young. yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's, that's fine. I love it. <laughs> I feel like we could talk for it. Well, you could talk for it. Right? <laughs> I would love to listen to you for it. <clears throat> Sorry, but um, I think we we gave out already a few. Um, yeah, so pieces yeah. of advice exactly. So listing is for, for sure. For it makes uh, a, a, a good to take a look. Portfolio reviews. It's really uh, a very good uh, way. Um, and uh, and any place is good for and an exhibition. any place is good for an exhibition. And just got together and just really like so any coffee place. A anything, anything. Anything really, anything like a a, a, a Baustelle, like a building which is de demolished, yeah, and then organize a group on, on, a, on a on a fence. Yeah, exactly. Just put your work on a fence. Yeah, that's why I really like, like sort of like this street art, like really pop up exhibition. Mm, doesn't open air. yeah, exactly. That doesn't matter where. Doesn't you know. need to be inside. No, the place. No, like like I really what I can recommend. Like get away from this idea. You have to put your your uh, work in a gallery or in a in a museum. Yeah, it's it's. I really believe that any way for real innovative contemporary art, these spaces are not working anyway. I mean, for me, it was really a disappointment. I'm sorry. I really love you, Kunzamlung NRW, but the Joseph Boys uh, uh, exhibition. Yeah was actually for me sort of a disappointment maybe because i've seen the um, the hamburger uh, bahnhof in berlin yeah. uh, and they had an amazing an amazing boys collection there so the work was although it was like white cube macy mm -hmm. uh, but with big big windows which is sort of broke this whole thing mm -hmm. but they had an amazing collection there and an uh, amazing exhibition And for, for the compare, then then poor Kunzamlung uh, NRW, then here presented for me was a little bit weak. No, uh, um, was a lot of video work, and that's very hard to when you have like 20 video works. It's very very hard to see the exhibition. Mm. You know, to focus on all of them. Oh yeah, exactly. You always have to sit front of one, so it's supposed to be. And boys had a lot of installational work, so it's sort of um, more dynamic. Yes, no yes, it's more present. You know, it's more present, and more touchable. You know, because it has this spatiality and not this two-dimensional screen. You yes. Know? So, so that's why that's why um, um, just doesn't matter where doesn't matter where really and and a couple of artists are gets together and they can organize something somewhere yeah. you don't have to fight on your own no no really not this i really believe in uh 
four or five people are come together and then you can have a really amazing exhibition. Doesn't matter where, you know, somewhere mm. in, in a cellar, in a dachboden, and in an um, attic, yeah. in a, in a park, in, in a cafe. It doesn't matter yes. really where, you know, just organize a little bit yourself and do it, mm. you know, do it. That's, I think this is, that's what I also learned. That's what we did as well, you know, and really like, I really would like to encourage also the young artists to create alternative places. Uh, every, for this. Uh, yes. And, and not just that for themselves. So anywhere where they can put a foot in, mm -hmm. they should do that and then really make an artist run space. Yeah. You know, not just for them and for other artists as well. It really pays off. Mm -hmm. I really believe for an experience as well and for the network and everything which do, you can gain from an artist run space. I really believe this is a, an amazing. So the more, the better, mm -hmm. you know, and it can very, I know the problem, that's the good part and the bad part also here in Dusseldorf, you know, because you have a Kunst Academy, an art academy, which is like great, of mm -hmm. course, mm -hmm. you know, but it's also like a little bit elitist, mm -hmm. you know, so then the gallery is already checking out and everyone gets to get into a gallery from there yeah. instead of they really organizing themselves and they just really setting up like really alternative places where mm -hmm. they can simply just show their works, Yeah, you know, don't care that they have the run, a run gang, Every year they have this exhibition where they can show their work. It's nice, you know, but you can make so much more mm -hmm. and there are so much of them there, you know, so it cannot be so hard to get together and just look around in, in, uh, um, in Dusseldorf, where are these places which could be occupied and taken over for our sake. <laughs> You sound like a pirate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trying to just, you know, get as much yeah. in as possible. Yeah. I, I, I like I, it. Yeah. I'm, I, I think I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit like that, you know, it's like, uh, I, I really don't care where I'm showing my work. You know, I like a little bit of a prof professionality. You know, but I had uh, um, myself in Budapest, a small gallery. I mean, the gallery was maybe, maybe 15 square meter, mm. like this room where we are sitting right here or yeah. something like that, you know, and I was putting every nail in the wall for an exhibition. And then I also made the, the hole in the wall again, away when it was end. And I put it the next, <laughs> nail it to the wall and it was the next exhibition that like really I'm painting the walls and was doing everything myself. Mm -hmm. But I was always trying to give a professional, so the artist I invited, I invited like, I created six exhibitions in a year mm -hmm. and I invited artists always from abroad and also Hungarian artists and they would be able to exhibit together and network with each other. And um, the hall was actually a building, like an old school building, which was an art organi organization, a nonprofit art organization, get it from the local government. Mm -hmm. And um, there the artist got a space. And I used my space not just to be like sort of a um, studio for me, uh, where I'm able to work, but I also created this gallery and it was amazing. And at one point in this 15 square meter, 200 people wanted to come in, you know, so downstairs was a cafeteria and we had to make groups and take them up in groups. Oh, you know. turns. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's really, really, it, it can, uh, such a small space can turn out something really amazing, Yeah. you know, and then, and then, uh, uh you and people know, want that. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. See that. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's really, and, and it, it's an amazing experience as an artist to have something like that. Yeah. Not just as, also as an organizer, but also then, then someone who is exhibiting, mm -hmm. you know, and we, they were all young artists. You know, I know all of them from London, from the university, you know, and from Budapest, mm -hmm. you know, and I, at that time, I also traveled a lot to London, for example. 
I already as a gallery owner and, uh, Ooh, oh, yes. and uh, for final shows, you know, and I really watched the final shows in London from uh, different uh, art schools mm -hmm. and universities. And I was picking people, you know, and I said, like, I want you come here, <laughs> you know, and it was like really totally like they had to send their work yeah. on their money and I sent back the work on my money. At that time, I also had a very good job in Budapest, so I could afford it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's what how we did it, actually, mm -hmm. by simple. You know, and they always uh, could uh, sleep over in my apartment. Yeah, so they had a very nice weekend, a long weekend in Budapest yeah. with a nice exhibition opening. You know, they could see a nice city. I took care of them. Then they had food mm -hmm. and a nice sightseeing and everything. And then we made a really, really nice exhibition opening. And then when the exhibition was over, then I sent the work back and, back and that was it, you know. All for the sake of having an exhibition. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow. You know, and then it was a lot of people was, and I made a proper promotion online. Yeah. You know, which it, is yes, exactly. another great part nowadays. It's so easy to promote. Yeah, exactly. It. Nowadays it's easy to promote. Yeah. You know, and then you can really have like for an exhibition opening to three hundred people, yeah. you know, which is not it's quite that's a lot, yeah. That's a lot, I think. A place that fits that many people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, so that's why uh, you can everyone can be surprised what can happen with a fifteen square meter space, you mm -hmm. know. No, you so. just gotta, I don't know, give it some purpose, I guess. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's really, and even if it's it's even if it's a living room, like I'm not joking. Even if it's a living room, you know, that could be a very nice concept, you know, of of a traveling exhibition, and then really you have then an opening for light in the living room. Would mm. the exhibition not run for a month? No, it would be really an opening and that would be it, like a pop-up one day, one night exhibition. Yeah, I mean, and you then, don't want to have people have in your... Yeah, and then you, have, then you have maybe 200 people in a night in your apartment, yeah. in your... Uh, and then, uh, yeah, that's how it is. But, you know, that's fun. That's party. Yeah, so true. Not alcohol and drugs. <laughs> it's a different way of enjoying it, uh, Yeah, guess. exactly. You know, then, then when these people are coming in, you know, and then to really taking a look, then they are like really conversations yeah. and they're great vibe. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is really a great vibe what's happening it gives everyone that comes straight away a different feeling to it it's yeah. not an event it's not uh, oh you have to wear a tie to come here mm -hmm. yeah you know yeah. what i mean exactly it's, it's not official it's exactly like just yeah more underground it was funny in hunger in budapest we had this sec uh, secret house party uh, that was really like always another location mm -hmm. and it was uh it was really with the dj and it was a great party and it was in a an apartment somewhere in the downtown. And then uh, the people who were part of this Facebook group, then always in the same day you get like today is the parties here and there, nice, you nice. know. Those are the best. I know. And it was <laughs> it was amazing parties, really amazing There's parties. Called um the best parties start in the kitchen. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it was always like that, you know, it's always the kitchen is the best part. You know, so I remember it also by me when I was living in our, or this house where I grew up after I was 16, more or less, I was living there alone on mm -hmm. one part by, because my mom was <laughs> working abroad. And, uh, and it was really, we were always sitting in the kitchen. It was just like... <laughs> I didn't, I didn't move from the kitchen. The people were coming and going and I was just sitting in the kitchen. <laughs> There's something magical about that place. Yes. I don't know why. I had so many parties in my kitchen as well. Love mm -hmm. it. Like, I, I had a part, I, like, I had a bunch, but one was in a kitchen in Berlin back in the days. The kitchen was, uh, I swear to God, like half this room. Like really small <laughs> kitchen, like... <laughs> three four by three meters yeah square kitchen and really not a lot of space to move around with a table in the middle <laughs> we did a party with at least 200 people <laughs> yeah, <you see? laughs> in the 200, par 200 party fits, uh, like 200 people fits everywhere half of them in the kitchen yeah. half of them outside <laughs> yes <laughs> okay 
<laughs> like I couldn't move around. I swear to God. <laughs> yeah, that's why. That's why. You know, that's why this is like just working out simply. You know, a kitchen as an exhibition space. <laughs> like really. Yes. Let's go back to that <laughs> because totally derailed. <laughs> Yeah, but this is how it is, you know, in the kitchen is an exhibition space and mm -hmm. then you are doing like a one event and the, and then people can take a look to your artwork. You know, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. you know, it's what just, you can do, Rafa. Yeah, yeah, this is really amazing. And you never know who is walking in there. You know, I mean, really, I mean, I mean, like, you never know all of these people where they will be at one point. Yes. You know, what is when... All the potential of exactly, the context. Exactly, exactly. The potential of the context. You know, what what happens when one of them is a big CEO somewhere, you know, and then says like, oh man, I remember that was a great part and I really love your artwork. So you know what? I will collect you now. I have the money. You know, and I have to tell like, it can be then for one artist is enough on, when one person starts to collect you mm. you know this can finance your art or your life then someone starts to collect your artwork mm. you know so it's, it is quite amazing from what what can come you know and and we are not doing that because we want that but then that's what will happen you know mm. and so that's why just everywhere everywhere organizing something you know? i really appreciate you like throwing out the, the in incentive to do this. Because I feel like um, it's like, it doesn't lack motivation out there, but it, li it lacks mm, in a way like to be disciplined, lacks discipline mm -hmm. and like, but great ideas often help push that. And and I love how, how um, we are, we're talking about getting rid of the idea that we have to um, exhibit our work in galleries. Love that. Yeah. And that's a great piece of advice <laughs> for the coming generation. Yes, I really believe so. You know, then this is working. I mean, we had some experience with such stuff. In Budapest, we organized, that was, I called the biggest exhibition space of the world. And that was the Gojdu Udvar. This is like a hof. That was a new project. They were renovating, an investor was renovating uh, several um, houses in the um, inner city, you know, and it was like amazing houses for like a very high price, the apartments, very high price. And below everywhere were for stores, mm -hmm. you know, for restaurants or yes. whatever stores. But for years it was empty. They were not able to rent it out. Because it was know. too expensive. It, yeah, exactly. You know, And then we came with our little art organization and we said like, okay, what if we would like fill your empty stores with art? Yeah. And we did that. He, the, they are the, the manager was really open for it. And we did that. You know what? Two years later, they rented out every places because everywhere where artists go, it's hip. Yeah. You know, and they really artists started to come and people started to come because of the art and suddenly the place became hip and then suddenly everyone wanted a place there. So then afterwards, of course, the source when you would go there now mm. is the most vivid corner in Budapest with full of bars and restaurants and clubs yeah. and, and little stores, but they still kept a little bit this artsy stuff. So they mm. have like a little art market. Yeah, <clears throat> and the weekends and stuff like that. No? So it's like, so th also like someone who has a, 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 a in the in the business part, like mm -hmm. a manager who mm -hmm. has a little bit of a sense for art, likes art, yes. they'll be also open for such ideas, especially because in the whole world, uh, art was helping uh, parts of the city which were run down and were not very light yeah. to be hip again, mm -hmm. you know, and whole New York works like this. Like, uh, that's what happened actually. Then Chelsea w was a drag hole before, mm -hmm. and then artists moved there because they could afford that. And then Chelsea became hip, of course. Then it became hip, became expensive, and the artists moved from the other end. <laughs> the mafia comes in. Exactly, and that's, <laughs> and that's what happens, you know, like when yeah. I was there, then already Dumbo in Brooklyn was not affordable, but Dumbo became Brooklyn Dumbo that was only also so storage, um, industrial storage places. And artists came in there 
and it became totally hip. And then they turned all of the storage places into apartments, uh, like really fancy apartments, like lofts, mm. you know. And then, of course, then them artists went to Greenpoint. This is more a little bit more out. So that's how they like, you they know, move around the market. They, they move follows. around. They move around because the artists cannot pay a lot, so they yeah. are also looking for the cheap places. You know, and most also these industrial places were actually not for living, but they live there <laughs> in their studios, sure. you know, and then, and then, uh, it became hip. It's mm -hmm. all, and that's how New York works actually. So there you see it, but in also in other American cities, you they see that, for example, there was a street where every store closed. They mm -hmm. actually went bankrupt simply yeah. and they put it art inside and it became hip again. Yeah. You know, so that's why, and we made this experience. I read about this and I, we made this experience mm -hmm. in Budapest and it, and it works out. It works out. So every store, which is not rented out, especially for quite a while. And now after Corona, I mean, there's a potential. It is a lot of potential. Even at the beginning in March, yeah. even the local government had like sort of an action to have like a, um, rent reduced possibilities for starts up and other ideas, mm. you know, but I think like, like now you can see when you look around, like really like big, um, uh, bookstores, yeah. that's also in the Friedrichstrasse, a big bookstore closed down, you know, so they are like really big sp spaces mm -hmm. even there and just take a look from where you can somehow dig out a contact. Yeah, Maybe yeah. it is even uh, the person who is like putting in light to, to, to rent out yes. and you are calling the company who is supposed to rent it out and say just like, give it a shot. yeah, just, and say like, we really, we really, till you are renting it out, we really would like to have, to have there an exhibition. We will clean it. We are making an exhibition. We make it hip and then we clean it. Yeah. And then you have the place back and then a lot of people will come in there for the exhibition, mm. you know, and then it's also good for, for you, for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, there's a lot of great arguments <laughs> that help you. Exactly. Achieve that. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Love it. Um, sadly enough, <laughs> we're getting towards the end of the episode. Oh, like we, I mean, I really, I rarely do half this. <laughs> I feel like we could talk for like four or five hours. <laughs> <laughs> but apart from the light running out, running out, um, I would love to uh, start concluding not only um, with uh, the congrats, but also uh, asking you to share with us where we can maybe find your work where you can find out more about your projects. I have a website. It's interestingeyes.com. Like interesting eyes. Mm -hmm. Just like that. Dot com. So simple is that. They are most I'm trying to keep it updated. I have also um Instagram mm -hmm. account. This is not so easy. <laughs> I'll, but maybe I'll help people out. Yeah, Don't exactly. Worry. But it's Christina's eyes at Instagram, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they can find me there. There it's, it's my Instagram account is sort of a mixture of where I'm going and what I'm doing, mm -hmm. you know, little selfies, very little, not a, lo <laughs> a lot, but I'm, I'm also like, if I'm going for art exhibitions, yes. I'm making photos and, and then I'm posting. So people can really take a look like cool exhibitions, what's going on here and there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then sometimes I'm just seeing a nice, uh, la um, landscape or in Dusseldorf, especially I love when I'm going on the Oberkassel bridge and then it's uh, foggy or whatever. So it's always in a different light <laughs> than that sort of stuff, but also about my artwork a nice. lot. It's sort of a mixture. So those two are, uh, two great addresses where you guys can check yeah um christina's uh art out um obviously those um links will be linked up more posts and on the episode itself as well the description um 
before we end, I always want to give uh, my guests the opportunity to share um, another mm, point or anything that you feel like we have missed out on, which I doubt. <laughs> yeah, I also doubt it. <laughs> But maybe something that's on your mind that you feel is important to be said that we haven't addressed yet. Not really. Okay. okay. I think we were really, really addressed everything. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I get out of you one more thing um, as briefly as you can, <laughs> but not like, don't feel too much pressure, but a little bit uh, on um, what creativity means to you because that's something we haven't touched on i personally forgot <laughs> but now i didn't i mean creativity it's hard um it is something what i'm not choosing to have but i have it creativity mm -hmm. which is not just in art it is creativity what i really believed and helps in every part of the life mm -hmm. You simply just live, you know, creativity is sometimes very much needed, um, especially to survive. Yeah. Uh, I cannot imagine my life without creativity, you know, so, uh, and it's, it's sometimes it's really comes on surface in small things and sometimes in bigger things, but somehow it is always present. And uh, just um, everyone has it. I really believe just you have to find it. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone can, maybe some people have more, some people less, but yeah. every single one of us has creativity. Uh, just don't push it down. So let it, let it flow. Don't be scared of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let it flow. Nice. And with those words, um, I would like to thank you so much for being here uh, it has been um unofficially <laughs> my bad so hard to do this we had a first attempt <laughs> didn't work but uh, in the end when you keep um working hard for it oh you'll you'll manage so I'm really thankful we're all busy thank you for your time thank you for having me here yes it was so lovely talking to you yes. so many valuable uh lessons we've learned today and stories and interesting projects we have heard about and ideas we have talked. I'm really thankful for that as well. This has been a bless. Um, thank you all for listening today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Don't forget, I'm always looking for new people to have on the show. So if you feel like you would like to be part of it, just let me know, reach out to me. I'm Lucas, and this was a creative cast. <laughs>